I'm here today to talk about some of the methodology that we use in AstraZeneca in early phase trials, um, specifically uh, trials in proof of concept. Uh, now in proof of concept, the main endpoint tends to be a survival endpoint, PFS or OS. And the object when you get to this phase of development is to make a halfway decent decision, preferably an optimal decision, to go on to phase three. Uh, so this is kind of challenging given that you are not really at liberty to have a really, really robust sample size the way you would in phase three. So you now have to do more with less. What we want to do is we want to stop uh, programs that are not efficacious, not efficacious early and continue or accelerate programs that do have encouraging results in truth. So we start by looking at the external data. Uh, we're looking for standard of care data. We're looking for emerging uh, emerging competitive data and so forth in order to justify a couple targets that we use to uh, fuel this mechanism. Um, and then we also consider the actions that you would take after a particular trial. Now the thing is, the example I'm going to give you is a POC trial leading into a phase three, but this can be applied at any phase of development. So the idea is that decision making is going to drive what you do going forward in development. Uh, the method I'm going to show you uh, is something that we do upfront in planning. So it's going to help you. It's going to help promote forward thinking. It's going to provide a context for future results, and it's going to speed up decision making at the end of the study. Um, if I rewind maybe five, 10 years, oftentimes trials and programs would get their data, see the initial results, and then there would be all manner of debate, not just within the study team, but within the governance bodies as they decide to move on to phase three or not. This kind of creates a very large amount of white space, as we call it. Um, what we're proposing, based on a methodology proposed by Lalonde in 2007, is to break up the sample space for the statistic into either a go, a no-go, or a consider zone. In order to do that, we need a few things to put into the method. Uh, first and foremost are the target and lower reference values. Uh, the target value is a treatment effect that you would expect to promote a phenomenon of switching. So a treatment effect that is so good that people will want to use your drug even though there's a good alternative out there. Um, the other target that we look for is something called the lower reference value. The lower reference value is an estimate of what is necessary in a minimally clinically meaningful sense to get onto the market. Uh, and both of these are justified either by pulling the numbers from a commercially driven document called the target product profile or a meta-analysis or using a profile figure which is kind of a, is there a laser pointer? It's kind of a, yeah, all right, forget it. It's that, that figure there underneath the check mark there. Basically it lays out all the trials that you know about with their treatment effects and variability and it helps you set what you would expect the target and lower reference to be. So back to where we were. Right, so two other things. We also need to understand what the company's tolerance for risk is. And this is expressed in two different quantities, very similar to type one and type two error. Uh, we have a false stop risk, which is the risk of stopping the study when the truth is better than the target value also known as the acceptable risk associated with the target value. And then we have something called the false go risk, which is the risk of continuing the study when the truth is less than the lower reference value. This is related in a, uh, it's, it's kind of like type two error really. We, we also use something called the desired confidence. All right, so one minus this value is the desired confidence that you're better 
than the lower reference value in truth, given that you have seen a particular treatment, a treatment effect. Those two uh, values, they quantify the tolerance for risk that a company has. So with all of that, we produce routinely a diagram that looks very much like this. It has all of these, in, uh, all of these pieces of information included, as well as the information regarding sample size and variability. So to go through this a little bit, target value appears in several places, both graphically by the solid line and on the right side of the figure, uh, and then down by where you define the stop criterion. Uh, let's see here. The lower, lower reference value is in a similar way around this figure and so forth. The desired confidence and the false stop values are also included there. And then all of that is put together to come up with the definitions of the stop and go criteria. In this case here, uh, the go criterion is a hazard ratio of less than or equal to 0.55. The stop criterion is a hazard ratio of greater than or equal to 0.64. Um, this is all the planning material and so forth. When you run the trial, you then consider that observed hazard ratio opposite the stop and go criterion for your trial. That determines on the primary endpoint whether or not you have strong enough evidence to continue or not. Uh, we also calculate operating characteristics for this. Uh, these are analytically driven in most cases. Um, so in the case of the truth being the target value, the chance of a go decision with this set of criteria is 73%. The chance of stopping is 10% um, with a less a less optimistic treatment effect. The uh, hazard ratio in this case we're pulling out is equal to the lower reference value, 20% chance to go, and almost a 60% chance to stop. Uh, we also usually routinely uh, include no effect in here as well. And having a chance to stop of almost 100% is a good thing in terms of these criteria. Um, the other thing I want to point out here is that it's not so much the high values and the low values of the red or green that really kind of catch our attention here. In our case, we want trials that will yield value. I would much rather have a trial that gives me a yes or no at the end than one that leaves me you know, indecisive, so to speak. So what I really want is something that gives me a low chance of amber. In this case, the way we've got it laid out here, the highest case is 23%. That's pretty good. Um, again, this is another thing that is a matter of risk tolerance in your governance organizations within your companies. Also, we have what you intend to do if you see a treatment effect within one of the three zones. Uh, red is typically stop development. Yellow is typically consider other data, usually secondary endpoints. Sometimes people go outside to look at data and so forth. Um, and a green is a more aggressive continue planning right or continue uh, development right away. Um, there, there are lots of variations on this. Um, I've seen programs that have said, okay, Amber is just a less aggressive go. Go with a trial that maybe gets you more data earlier or something like that. Uh, Green is more of a heavy investment uh, with, a, with a full commitment in phase three or something like that. There's, there's a lot of stylistic things in here that you can do. Again, that also depends on your, your company's risk tolerance. Now, in the case where you want to look within the trial to kind of break out of that amber uh, and get to a solid red or green, what we've done in a couple of cases is we've looked at the secondary variables. In this case, we have a list of secondaries that go from secondary efficacy <laughs> into uh, safety, and at the very bottom is a quality of life endpoint. But the idea is that once you hit amber in, one of the, in the primary variable, you'd come and you'd look at the first secondary, 
And if you wind up with a red or a green, then you stop, as in you stop the decision procedure, not necessarily the, uh, the program. It depends on whether you break the tie in favor of red or green. Or if you hit amber in that first secondary, then you proceed to the second secondary and you do this again with a full stop one way or another at the end of six in this case. Let's see here. Now, setting the criteria for the secondary, you can do that in the same way as you do for the primary. So you can apply Lalonde, we call it Lalonde, um, to each of these endpoints. You can do them arbitrarily, you can do them however you like, really. It really depends on your tolerance for robustness and your risk tolerance. So a few principles to go along with this. Uh, number one is that the targets, the lower reference and the target value are as supported by data as possible. The earlier you are in development, we found that the less likely this is the case or that you have fewer data to work with. Uh, if you are in an area where there hasn't been many treatments, then you could find that there isn't a lot of data to work with and you're really kind of working on a, you know, on a subjective prior, if you will. Um, decision risks, they reflect the company's tolerance for error. So usually there's going to be some kind of guidance within your organization that says, hey, look, we tolerate, I don't know, no more than 25% amber given the target is true or something like that. You'll kind of have to work that out. Um, all aspects of setting the decision criteria of, are agreed at the time of trial design. So you want to do this up front, okay? Don't wait until the end. It'll be very, very subjective if you do and it'll cause many of the problems you're trying to avoid by doing this early. Um, again, you want to control the chance for an indecisive result. Uh, have agreed actions based on whether you see a red, green, or an amber. Know what you're going to do before you run the trial. Have a plan to decide when the primary variable is not decisive. That's the let's go to the secondaries, let's go to this outside data, let's go to whatever. Um, you want to lay all that out. Um, as I touched on before, this, as much as the example is an event study in phase two, we apply this everywhere we expect to be making a decision at the end of a trial. There are some exceptions, but they're very, very specific. Um, you can apply this in just about any kind of data type there is. I, I, I think as long as you have a distribution that you can model, you can find the percentile points and actually develop uh, the decision criteria accordingly. Uh, we've also done this both in the Bayesian sense and in the frequentist sense. Uh, the, the idea is that you want to minimize the risks no matter how you do it. Um, you can apply these in various designs, both in comparative and non-comparative. Most of my uh, trials are single arm oncology trials. I do this routinely, as early as candidate drug, drug uh, selection. Uh, interim analyses are something that you can apply with this as well. You're just working with less information and you have more looks, so instead of having a univariate distribution, you now have a bivariate distribution or a multivariate distribution to consider. Um, one last thing on sample size. Uh, this is a diagram that many of you may produce some variation on this or something like that for an event trial that assumes in this case that the uh, hazard ratio is the uh, lower reference value in, according to our example earlier. Um, and it powers a trial at 80% with two-sided I mean, two 0.1 alpha. In that case, this trial requires 161 patients with 112 events. If I compare this to what we did using the Lalonde method, as we call it, um, we now have uh, a difference of 61 patients because it required 100 patients in the example with only 70 events to reach a decent decision as laid out. Um, here are some references. 
The top reference is a paper that we are publishing in, I believe, pharmaceutical statistics. That's currently in press. Hopefully that will come out within the next 12 months. And here are a couple of others that you can, uh, that you can look into. I recommend the Lalonde paper. It, they they uh, actually go and talk about things in terms of model-based drug development, but they kind of laid out this whole three-area idea.